Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for having me. Thank you, everyone, for preferring to be here and outside. Um, so this is a, an ongoing project that I have with a variety of collaborators. And uh, multi-reference alignment, as we'll see, is a sort of a toy model where we can start understanding some phenomena which consist in observing a signal that's subject to a latent unknown group action with some noise on top of it. And uh, we'll uh, solve it. Uh, um, we'll solve this particular example as a way to try to understand cryo EM. I'll, I'll mention what this is, and in the end, I'll touch about a little bit about how this connects to some representation theory and what are the uh, uh, interesting uh, invariant theory, actually, more specifically, uh, 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 questions that 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 are behind and that we probably need to understand. Uh, so it's. Uh, a bunch of projects. There's three projects with uh, subsets of those authors at MIT, NYU, Princeton. Uh, Victor was a postdoc at MIT, and Shubro is at uh, National University of Singapore. So, cryo EM. Um, I would not be able to tell you what the um, uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry is for any given year, except for 2017, because it's about cryo EM, which is something that I think has interesting mathematics. Uh, so it was uh, awarded for this. It was also voted uh, method of the year by Nature Methods in 2015, a couple years before. So it's actually a growing method. And since people have gotten this Nobel Prize in Chemistry, I hear that they're selling those special microscopes uh, 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 quite well. Uh, MIT just bought two. Uh, so apparently, if you work on cryo EM, people are hiring. And uh, the idea of cryo EM is, uh, is so it's a technique to visualize uh, molecules. Right, so the way you would visualize molecules before then was to use X-ray crystallography. Right, so the idea of X-ray crystallography is that you actually uh, take your molecule, you crystallize it uh, somehow. So this is actually where the science goes in. How do you crystallize a molecule? It has to have a special symmetric and, and, and particularly structured pattern. Then once it's crystallized, you just uh, uh, shoot some X-ray beam through it. And just by looking at the diffraction pattern that you get on the other side, you can actually reconstruct what the molecule was by just moving this crystal uh, in different directions, right? So it's essentially a tomography reconstruction problem. And it's uh, uh, the, the, the signal processing technique is fairly well understood and not super complicated. The real question is, how do you crystallize? And there's still research going on there. Uh, cryo EM is actually. I just lost this, I think. Oh, no. cryo -M is actually doing something slightly different. So this is for molecules, think biomolecules, pretty large molecules that we actually do not know how to crystallize. And uh, the same way probably machine learning is coming in all, all fields and says you don't actually need to understand how you do things. You just throw them in and it's going to work. Uh, cryo -M is doing the following thing. It takes, say, 100,000 copies of those molecules, frees them in a very thin layer of ice, uh, ice is just an example. Uh, I think one of the Nobel Prizes to change the soup they're using there. And you have all these molecules, and then you just shoot not uh, X-ray beam, which would destroy them. You actually shoot an electron beam. And what you see is also a tomography, but the tomography is uh, uh, more complicated to understand. And the, what's difficult about it are two things. The first one is that the ice gives a huge amount of noise in the problem, much more than you would get in the uh, X-ray crystallography version. And the second one is that you actually don't know a priori which orientation the molecule had when you actually froze it and then threw this beam through it. So each of those molecules that you see here is actually potentially in a different, uh, as a p potentially different orientation. And what you see are just essentially random orientations of the same molecule projected in two dimensions and then with some a huge amount of noise added to it. So there's been some progress. They have not waited for us to solve it. So since 2013, this is what uh, uh, the output of X-ray crystallography, uh, uh, sorry, of electron, uh, cryo, cryo electron microscopy looked like. So it was referred to sometimes as uh, blobology. So you couldn't really see what was happening, but you can see, and today is actually something that was released uh, uh, the year of the maybe early 2018. This is what you actually see. So you could start seeing you know, the, some structures of the molecules and maybe try to understand how they would, uh, they would bind, et cetera. That's okay, so one molecule. That's one molecule, yeah. So they're pretty big. And well, you see. How big are they, roughly speaking, how many? How many atoms? Yeah. Uh, hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they're they're one pretty big. One molecule. Yeah, and so you're trying to understand the, what's called the uh, I think it's called the tertiary structure of the molecule, not the atomic structure. Um, okay, but this is uh, what we want to do. This is a biomolecule, so we want to understand proteins, so we we'll understand how they bind. Okay, so here's a cartoon version of what's happening. So here's your molecule. And you, it's subject to an unknown rotation. Your electron beam is shooting through it. And what you see is this two-dimensional 
projection, right? 2D tomography, so it's an integral DZ of some function uh, of uh, X, Y, Z. And, uh, and uh, you collect a bunch of those guys, all right? So in different, say, random orientations, uniform on the Haar measure. And, uh, and the goal is to start from those and go to the original one. Okay, so even in the noiseless case, it's not entirely clear you can do this, but there's some, uh, uh, the Fourier slice theorem, for example, guarantees that you can actually do it if you have uh, projection uh, uh, in all the directions. The problem is that, so this is something that's fairly well understood and you could probably, you know, teach in an undergraduate class. The problem is that uh, 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 this is what the output, so the pictures that you see are not really like this, they're actually like this, okay? And now you have to, even though we have a very nice high quality HDMI, there is actually a molecule here, you can, maybe you can, you can trace it here, uh, it's some uh, ribosome, and it's a huge amount of static there, and so the question is, so it's hard, so the, the noiseless thing tries to find common lines, the common lines here are completely destroyed and it's very difficult to actually do. So people can do it and we'll see a little bit of how you would want to do this uh, because you need to reconstruct. So here's the model that, uh, that we have. This is what I just described to you. So we have a compact group acting on our D. So here, uh, 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 I, I want to make sure that we all understand D here is not three because we have a three dimensional molecule. D is the discretization of the molecule that you have, okay? The group is the, um, the group, so it's typically expressed in terms of spherical harmonic coordinates, but uh, um, the group is acting on RD, and what I'm saying is that if I take a molecule and I take a three-dimensional rotation to it, it's gonna have an impact on what those uh, coefficients are, and this is what I mean by this group acts on RD. So it's a very complicated, uh, it's very complicated to understand how this action happens on so RD. So D is determined by how much um, uh, uh, resolution you want to have. So D is, D is like a million, say. If, if you want to have the right edge of, the, of, the, of this molecule, yeah, that's basically what's going to happen. Uh, how does it act then on RD? How do you, how do you so think of having a molecule in three dimensions. Yeah. You have a 3D grid, all right? So, that, so this is a simplified version. But let's say you have a 3D grid. I'm giving you the intensity. It's the grid, it's the grid. Yeah, it's the grid. And then when I rotate the molecule, you're going to have something different that's happening for the same molecule. So that's how it acts on the unknown parameter of interest that will be denoted by theta, that's this uh, uh, d-dimensional decorization of the molecule. And the observations that I'm getting are group action acting on theta, all right? So this is just the group action on theta. Uh, the group actions are gonna be assumed to be uniformly distributed on the Haar measure over this compact group. And then what's really important, so if there was just this, this if the, were my observations, I would be able to use this Fourier slice theorem, but I have this noise, which we know is big, and I'm gonna assume that this noise is, say, IID Gaussian noise for now, okay? Everything is IID across observations, so across uh, a measurement of molecules and across each of the locations of the molecule, okay? Of course, in practice, there would be some correlations uh, uh, here for each observation that I have, and uh, we're not gonna, it's already hard enough like that. Okay, but think of sigma as being huge, like two to the 10, compare, and, and this being of order one. Okay, so uh, uh, of course I'm, I'm losing one thing, which is the projection, right? So we had this two dimensional tomographic projection that was happening uh, after, uh, uh, after we rotate the molecule and image it. I will totally, so the multi-reference alignment problem is something that overlooks this projection altogether. All right, so we're just gonna look and try to understand what happens just because of the group action, as if we were able to observe a noisy molecule in three dimensions. So there's, uh, so this general uh, model encompasses a few examples. So for example, so here there's something called image registration. So here's a simple example where you have a picture of Turing that's rotated uh, on, the, on the plane and then you add some noise and, uh, and uh, you try to reconstruct the original image, for example. Another one uh, was applied, so the similar techniques were applied in robotics, where here the group is the special Euclidean group, where, so this is called SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping, where you have self-driving cars that move in an environment that's unknown, and they're trying to map the environment as they go. And the one that's the closest to what I'm gonna describe is this radar example. So this is an example from a paper in 2013, where people were saying, okay, if I want to understand the shape of a plane, that's moving, so LOS is line of sight, so your plane is actually coming towards you, and you're just you know, shooting your radar as you go, but of course the plane is actually moving, so you have some modulation of phase in the signal that you're getting, and the, every time you send a new signal, you get a different thing. 
And what they claim here, so this is a, a, a more an electrical engineering example, they say, oh, there's some features of the plane that we can actually reconstruct just by looking at some singular fe features in what we see. So here, clearly, there's not enough, there's not too much noise. You can actually see those features by eye, and you can understand a little bit of what this is. Uh, okay. I don't know how the group act, where the group action is here, though. So here, the group action is uh, phase modulation, all right? So you have, and actually, this is going to be very close to the one I'm going to be describing, so uh, if you want to see what it is later on, but think of uh, having the shift of a signal. So you have a signal that's coming, and it's shifted along the circle, and you discretize it again. Okay, so uh, these are the examples we're going to be seeing. So uh, the only example I will be covering today is uh, the example of uh, cyclic shifts. So you have a continuous signal on the interval 0, 1. Let's call it F. And what I'm going to be observing, so first of all, I'm going to shift my signals. So this is uh, addition mod 1. So I add some shifts, shift 1, shift 2, shift 3. I observe not those guys, but what I actually observe is those guys plus some noise on top of it. Okay? And the goal is to reconstruct the original signal from a long list of, uh, of uh, such uh, examples. So turns out that shifts are well understood. There's the so-called shift theorem, I guess, in, uh, in uh, Fourier analysis that's uh, telling you how shifts act on the Fourier transform. And it's not something that's uh, entirely natural. So I'm going to look at the discrete Fourier transform. Uh, uh, sorry, the Fourier transform. So I'm going to assume that I have a band-limited signal, so I can actually represent uh, f as a finite uh, linear combination of Fourier, uh, I mean, uh, of, uh, of Fourier modes, and the, co the Fourier coefficients are going to be called f hat. And uh, since it's band-limited, if I have enough uh, signals, so if I discretize it fine enough, I will be able to recover f entirely from those Fourier coefficients, <laughs> right? And so I'm going to look at some discrete discretization, f of 1 over d, 2 over d, et cetera. Think of the example I just uh, showed you before. OK, and so now the group action, what is the group action doing? So we know that in the, uh, uh, in the original space, uh, we have addition mod 1. So that's my group action gs, which is indexed by a specific shift, so picking a particular uh, uh, group uh, element of the group is amounts to picking one particular shift uh, in the interval 0, 1. And when I look at the Fourier transform of this, what this Fourier shift uh, theorem tells me is that what's happening is I have Fourier coefficient, and now the Fourier coefficient is modulated, the kth Fourier coefficient is modulated by e to the minus 2 pi i s, with, which is the shift to the power k. So this is how it's kind of a little weird in the sense that they're all modulated by the same complex uh, unit complex number, but the power changes depending on which Fourier coefficient I'm actually looking at. So it's not going to make our life uh, 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 completely easier, but it's a good way to actually see what the problem is, and it's actually a, a, a simple way to define the model I'm going to be looking at uh, in Fourier space. Okay, so we'll call this the phase shift model. So it's a instantiation of this multi-reference alignment that I described to you for specific groups. So here, the group action, so I have my theta, the group action GZI acts on theta uh, as described by the, this modulation of the Fourier coefficient. The Gaussian noise uh, is still here, and I'm going to assume for normalization so that all of the signal-to-noise ratio is captured by this parameter sigma, which is the signal uh, size. I'm going to assume that uh, my signal is normalized. Of course, I can always uh, normalize in, uh, in this way. And uh, moreover, I'm going to assume that my latent group actions are uniform on the, on the Haar measure, which here is just uh, uniform on the unit circle. OK? So this is the model I'm going to be considering. And uh, uh, I'm actually a statistician, so there are some uh, pretty obvious statistical questions that you may ask here. And uh, the first one is the so-called sample complexity, which is how many samples are needed to estimate the signal. OK? And of course, implicitly is at a certain accuracy. Another way to put it is, given a certain number of samples, how close will be my estimator from the true signal? Now, close has to be, I need to mod out this group action, because there's no way I can find the correct group action. So I'm going to say, OK, if you give me a candidate tau to estimate theta, I'm going to align tau the best I can with this group action to theta and see how close I am to the original signal. That's my measure of performance, and that's the natural measure of performance you might want to have here. So that's the pure statistical question. Now, this is a large-scale problem, and we'll see that the optimal way of solving this problem does not lead to efficient algorithms. And so, of course, you could ask the next question, which is, are there efficient uh, ways to actually uh, get to this optimal rate? 
And then uh, towards the end, I would like to touch upon some uh, interesting question, which is, okay, here I specialized it to a very specific group, a very simple group. And the question is, how does this rate of estimation depend on, this, uh, on the group that I've chosen? Now, here should be, how does it depend on the projection? But I'm not going to touch upon that at all. Uh, I'll, mention, I'll mention some computational results, some, some numerical results that give us a hint about what's happening. Okay, so another way to view this problem, so here remember I had this continuous signal, I was shifting it on the circle, and then I was discretizing it. And uh, um, Bandera, Tarikar, Singer, and Zhu in, in 2014 were looking at a problem that was uh, very similar to it, but not quite this. What they were doing is rather than first shifting and then discretizing, they were first discretizing and then shifting by uh, some integer shift. And so this is a, a nice way to view this. So you have your parameter theta, which is just a vector now in D dimension. You shift it by each coordinate by Li, all right? So when I take RL of theta, that's a new vector, and its jth coordinate is just the j plus alpha d coordinate of the original signal. Same thing, I take a discrete signal and I shift it, but here I have to take my shifts L to be uh, between one and d. And in Fourier, so I can take the Fourier coefficient, and what changes from what I've been describing is the simple thing is that here I used to have any uh, so this used to be z to the k, where z was e to the minus 2 pi i s. And now here I'm actually constraining this s to be of the form k over d. All right, so now I have, I'm shifting by a power of a, k through, of a dth root of unity. Okay, so it's very similar. The reason, so that was the original uh, 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 model that we set out to study. And very quickly we noticed that this actually suffers from several limitations when you're trying to study the statistical properties, which is that different discretizations of the same signal, I could just pick the same signal and discretize it by just tiny shifts. And it, they would be very far in this row distance that I'm actually looking at. And that did not seem right. And it actually, of course, using, you know, as usual, going to the continuum smooth things out quite a bit. And so we decided to, uh, uh, so all the results I will be presenting will be pertaining to this phase shift model, the continuous version. But for intuition, I will refer to this, uh, uh, you know, sh discrete shift model. So uh, just so that we see what's happening, because uh, I, I have very little intuition in the Fourier domain. It's more analytical. All right. So how did people solve this problem? When I, when, so uh, I learned about this problem when Afonso Bandera came as a postdoc at MIT and he was describing it to me. And they were using semi-definite program relaxations to actually solve uh, the problem as follows. They said, okay, I have shifts of the same signal. So I'm just gonna have a modular approach to solve this problem. I'm gonna first remove the shifts and then remove the noise. Okay, so this is what the problem looks like. I know their shifts. If I knew how well, the, how, what the relative shifts of those guys were, I would just align them and I would just average out because my noise would not just be IID Gaussian. And then I would have the usual rate. So if you're not familiar with statistics, well, trust me, this is the most standard statistical rate you would get. It's uh, the standard deviation of the noise divided by square root of the sample size that you have, right? So that's the scaling you would get from say central limit theorem for an average. All right, so if I, could, if I could synchronize them perfectly, I would be able to get this very nice rate. And this is the approach that people have been trying to do. They've tried to found those shifts first, then realign, and then average. And if you have some sharp features, like the example that I gave with the plane, you could find those features in two different signals, put them on top of each other, and then start averaging. By the way, uh, this post-it will be here for a couple of slides if you want to keep in mind what the model actually is. All right, so. This is a good idea at high signal to noise ratio when you actually have pretty sharp features that come out. So this is the true signal, this is my IMR observations, the dots, they're pretty close. I can still see those sharp features in my example, but we're thinking of the signal to be of size one and the noise to be of size two to the 10. Okay, so this is going to be something where the, it looks more like that and you know, you can look at it as long as you want. It's going to be very hard for you to actually align those things. And I can actually, so there's actually a paper that studies this, but I can convince you maybe with a very simple example, take D equal two. I have one of the coordinate of theta, which is zero. The other one, which is say order one. And now synchronizing means that, so what's going to happen? I'm going to have either this zero one or one zero, right? Those are the two things I can see. And then I'm going to have some Gaussian noise. Now, the question is, if I try to synchronize those guys, I'm gonna to try to, the natural thing to do is to put the largest with the largest and the smallest with the smallest. But this will have some, you know, some intrinsic bias. So here, if I pick square root two, I know that with probability 16%, I will actually have the re order reversed. 
And therefore, you can give me as many examples as you want. I'm never going to find what I want. Okay? So I'm going to have, I'm going to reconstruct a theta which is much larger than sigma square root 2 for the large one and which is actually much smaller than 0 for the small one. So, you know, this is not going to work at, uh, I mean, even moderate NSNR. And so the question is, can we still, we don't want to recover those uh, uh, relative rotations they, or relative shifts. They have no importance to us. But what we want is to just get theta. So what we want is just the orbit of this group. We want to find just the orbit when I just take this theta and I shift it or I, I, I apply this phase, uh, this phase modulation. And so there's a natural way to view this problem from a statistical perspective, and it's using a mixture of Gaussian. All right, so what is a mixture of Gaussian? It's just a, uh, uh, um, uh, um, sorry, it's just a random variable whose uh, probability density function is a convex combination of Gaussians. And the way you draw them is by saying, okay, I'm going to first draw from which component I'm going to have from this, uh, from this convex combination. The, the weights in the convex combination is a parallel distribution. That's called the latent variable. And then once I actually see which one, I'm going to draw from the corresponding Gaussian. And so here, of course, it's not as simple. We have a continuum of Gaussians. But if I look at y, so here, so think, so here uh, this is a complete abuse of notation. This means this is just the integral of the probability distributions of uh, standard Gaussians, multivariate standard Gaussians with uh, variance sigma square, and uh, by standard I mean ID, uh, variance sigma square, and uh, mean, which is this uh, GZ applied to theta. Okay, so I have this continuum, I have this entire thing, and the way I'm going to draw them is exactly how it's described here. First, I'm going to just go on the orbit of theta where my shift tells me to be, and then I'm going to add some Gaussian noise. So this is just a mixture of Gaussian. And if I have a mixture of Gaussian, I know that there's completely standard statistical techniques to solve it, which are namely the maximum likelihood estimator. So let's see what we would get if we were to apply off-the-shelf result for this. Well, there's a couple of papers. There's uh, this paper uh, in 95 that was, you know, finding the optimal rate of convergence. And there was this paper, which was redoing this, but actually being correct this time. And, uh, and uh, what it tells me is that what's going to happen is that the rate of convergence is going to look like some constant that depends on sigma and d, and that will be important for us because sigma is huge. And um, we have uh, the rate is n to the minus 1 over 2d. So in particular, as soon as the d is logarithmic in my sample size, I'm going to have nothing. I'm not going to have anything. So this is what's called usually the curse of dimensionality. If you heard that, it just means that I have 1 over the dimension in the exponent. And um, so this is an issue, and it's basically it's coming from the fact that I'm actually insisting on having this rate. This is actually really a soup overall possible mixtures and theta. And what's going to happen is that I'm actually going to find some thetas that whose distance from each other is depending on n about this, and it's very hard for me to distinguish them. So one way to overcome this is to go not to uniform, but pointwise results. And if you want to go to pointwise results, the problem is that I like to prove optimality, and there's no notion of optimality that works for pointwise uh, estimators. So this is how it goes. I have this uh, parametric rate. If I do the following, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to place myself at a macroscopic scale, which prevents me from having those, uh, uh, those parameters theta to depend on my sample size. So I'm going to say, OK, my theta has to be either of order 1 or maybe 0 if I want to have some vanishing Fourier coefficients. But I certainly don't want them to go to 0 as my sample size go to infinity. Now, if I do this, I've sort of cheated my way into getting parametric rates, which are the 1 over square root of n that you would get from the central limit theorem. And then you have some constant that depends on sigma, the uh, noise level, and d, the discretization level that you're looking at. And so we're going to make this assumption so we can actually focus entirely on the scaling in sigma. And here you should ask me, what about the scaling in d? I do not treat at all the scaling in d. And that's the, definitely the most burning question that follows this. Because people, the race for this game is to have the highest possible d. But let's see how it scales with sigma. OK, remember, the benchmark is sigma over square root of n. That's what we would get from an average if we had uh, a perfect knowledge of what the shifts are. OK. So this is uh, uh, results that we obtain, and I'll, later on I'll explain to you how they, uh, they fit in this framework. So in the worst case signals, if I say, OK, even if you put this assumption that uh, signals have to be bounded away from 0, then the scaling in sigma will be sigma to the d. And that's awful. That's basically telling you there is no amount of data you can ever collect that will give you an accurate picture of what's happening. <laughs> 
So how do people do it, right? I mean, if this is not possible, well, here when I actually constructed this, I actually built some very specific signals that are far from each other at this very specific distance, but that are extremely hard to distinguish in this model. And the way I do it is by having some careful cancellation of their Fourier coefficients. There's actually some nice additive combinatorics that come here. Now, the second thing is if you have uh, optimal rate of estimation for typical signal. What is a typical signal? Well, it's a signal that has essentially no vanishing uh, Fourier coefficient. All right, so all my Fourier coefficients are non-zero. I will call this a typical signal. I call it typical because uh, uh, they're a set of, uh, you know, the, the complement is a set of measures zero in RD. And here I have this scaling, which is better, right? It's not sigma to the D, it's sigma to the three over root N. Still worse than what I would get if I had sigma over root N, if I had perfect knowledge of what my uh, signals are. And we can interpolate everything in between by just changing the cancellation pattern that I have. Okay, and that's for, for example, for signals whose Fourier coefficients is supported on their first S coefficients. I'm sorry for the uh, notation overloading. S here has nothing to do with the shift. It's just the support of my Fourier transform. Okay, so I'm going to focus on, on, on these two things and uh, see what are the tools that we need to have to understand this. And in particular, uh, being a statistician, I, I'm shocked to see the sigma to the three, and, and I want to uh, understand why. So the trick that we're going to be using, the main machinery we're going to be using is uh, what's called moment matching. And so moment matching is, uh, is something that's been developed actually in the context of mixtures of Gaussians. And it's trying to understand how close two distributions are by how close their moments are. OK, so the key quantity here is this delta. So delta m is measuring the distance so between moments of order m of my observations when I don't have the noise. What does it mean? Here r is my group action. r theta is, uh, is just a, a, a random group action. Here this expectation is with respect to random group action. I tensorize it to the m, so I have a tensor of order m here. And I look at the difference that I get for some theta and some tau. Okay, so here are two candidate signals. And the way I want to discriminate them is by looking at how far are those two tensors. Okay, if they're uh, uh, the same signal, it should be zero. If they're different, there should be some m that starts telling me that they're different. The scale at which I'm going to be looking at is this epsilon. Epsilon will be eventually the rate of estimation that I'm actually looking at. So when, uh, the way I'm going to think about this problem is by saying, if I want this to be sigma to the three over root n, for example, how m should be, how large m should be to discriminate between those two guys. Okay, so here are, so we can do this for any subgroup uh, uh, um, uh, for any compact subgroup of the uh, um, orthogonal group, but uh, let's just think of GZR shifts. And so the result goes as follows. If there exists a K such that all the first K minus one gaps between tensors, of, between moments over the K, so I will call this moment over M, if the first K ones are essentially indistinguishable, they're much smaller than the scale at which I'm considering that problem. But the kth one is actually at the scale at which I'm considering my problem. So the way you want to think about this is that this is 0, 0, 0, 0, oh, non-zero, I can see that, right? So this is essentially the amount of statistical noise I need to basically see whether those guys are 0 or not. Then if this happens, then the KL divergence, so this D here is the KL divergence, so the uh, relative entropy between P theta and P tau scales like, so epsilon squared is just the parametric rate, but sigma to the minus 2K, OK? So, right, so here this is how far those distributions are, and this ultimately will tell me if I can actually distinguish theta from tau from the observations that I'm actually getting. So if theta, if this is large, I need very few observations to distinguish between theta and tau. So what this is telling me is that, well, if k becomes large, I'm going to need a lot of observations. If I, if I cannot distinguish those low moments, I'm going to need a lot of observations to distinguish between those two distributions. Now, what's interesting is that this is upper and lower bounded. So this is actually of the same order. So this moments really control the, KL, the relative entropy between two things. So it's just an expansion, of course. But interestingly, this is this expansion along moments that actually matter for this problem. It could be an expansion along any basis I want, but it turns out that this is the one that captures what I need. And so now, when I know this, well, this will allow me to get immediately upper and lower bound for two reasons, for the lower bounds because, well, if I cannot distinguish between theta and tau, I cannot estimate theta and tau at an accuracy which is better than epsilon. So that tells me that I cannot, uh, uh, this is my lower bound. This is the optimality <laughs> result. And for the upper bound, it's known that the relative entropy controls the curvature 
of the uh, log likelihood around its maximum. So it's actually controlling its stability around its maximum. And so uh, now, what I, now that I have this, uh, essentially, uh, so this is the summary in words of what I said. I say, if you can match k minus 1 moments, then the divergence is of order sigma to the minus 2k. And now I convert this into saying that the MLE, the maximum likelihood estimator, is minimax optimal. And this is the rate that it's enjoying at its optimal. OK, so the rate that it's enjoying is sigma to the k over root n. So going from here to here is a standard statistical exercise. The real contribution is to understand that this gap in moments are really what controls the KL divergence. OK? So this is how we're going to get those rates. This is how we're going to get the sigma to the 3 over root n is by saying that we can actually match two moments, but not three, for generic signals. For d, well, you know, if you give me any signal I want, I can actually match moments all the way to d minus 1, but d, this one I will actually see the difference. So going from moments to rate is a recurrent theme, actually. So the first time I learned about this was in this uh, very influential uh, work of Lepsky and Mirovsky Spokoini in 99, where they were trying to estimate some non-smooth functionals of the mean of a Gaussian vector. And they were using this technique, which was a, a brand new technique at the time. And then it's actually uh, uh, been pushed on. There's a really beautiful paper by Tsai and Lowe uh, that uh, using Hermit polynomials gets sharp constants. So here I have everything up to numerical constants. They actually get exactly sharp constants by uh, 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 using the Bernstein constant. It's actually quite nice. And, uh, and, but it turns out that similar ideas in a much softer way were actually developed uh, as, uh, already by uh, Lindsay uh, for mixtures of Gaussians. OK? So now I want to understand what kind of signals I can actually distinguish using low order moments. So here, uh, uh, here's a signal, theta. It looks like this. I chose it so that there's only four Fourier coefficients that are non-zero. There's really just two. It's a symmetric. Uh, in real um, uh, signal. So this is what theta looks like. And the way I'm going to construct a signal that I cannot distinguish well from this guy is by just flipping the image. Okay, So if I flip this image, so this is what it means to, I'm just changing the sign of the Fourier coefficients. This is what it looks like. So I'm just, I did this animation so you can see that they're not the same because it's kind of, it's a little bit of an uh, illusion. And, um, and uh, what happens is that now, let's try to see how many moments we actually need to distinguish those two guys. So if I look at the first moment, I can actually tell you what the first moment is. The first moment is actually the zeroth Fourier coefficient. So if they have the same zeroth Fourier coefficient, I'm certainly not going to be able to distinguish those guys. There's really no information in the first moment. It's just the average coordinates. And so if the theta naught is the same, this is the DC component, it's the same for those two guys. The second moment is actually telling me what the autocorrelations of theta are. So theta inner product with theta shifted by 1, theta inner product shifted by 2, theta inner product shifted by 3. If you apply a little bit of Fourier uh, analysis, this is telling you that really when I'm giving you all those d numbers, I'm really actually giving you all the squared or the moduli of the Fourier coefficients. But here, clearly, they're the same. They just differ by a sign. Now, if I look at the third moment, it's called triple correlations in the, in the original space. And if you look at, uh, at uh, the Fourier domain, it's actually what I'm really giving you is the product of three Fourier coefficients of the f where the indices actually sum to 0. OK, so I'm only giving you that. OK, so here they will be the same. And, then he, and, 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 and the reason why they will be the same is because I have only basically two Fourier coefficients that, are, that I can play with, and that's how I make those cancellations happen. But I could actually be, make it much more complicated. And here you can keep going, and you will see that the first eight moments match. So if the first eight moments match, so if I apply my theorem, so what does it tell me? It tells me that the amount of data I need to actually separate those guys. So here I will have a scaling. So if eight moments match, I'm going to have so sigma to the um, uh, yeah, so first eight moments match, so k is equal to 9, which means that I have sigma to the minus 2k as the order of magnitude. I mean, there's an epsilon that I'm hiding in, the, in this uh, um, uh, relative entropy, which means, because that's the sentence that we had, which means that the rate, the, 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 the distance between those two guys, the rate of estimation, or even the amount of data I need to test whether those guys are the same, should scale like n to the uh, like n should scale like sigma to the 18 before I can actually start distinguishing those two guys. And they're actually quite different, right? One was the flip of the other one. OK, but those are very specific signals, certainly not generic signals as I described. And so for generic signals, it turns out that you can actually show that you cannot match moments of order 3. So as soon as you look at your third order tensor, 
then you will be able to see which signal you're actually uh, looking at. All right, so you're, it becomes uh, the, uh, an injective uh, um, a map. And so the rate of estimation becomes sigma to the cube over root n. And it also uh, indicates that sigma three moments suffice. So how am I going to use those three moments suffice? Well, I'm going to use the fact that those three moments suffice that by rather than looking at the maximum likelihood, I'm going to actually try to read off from the third moment, which I can actually estimate from data. I'm going to try to read off directly what my theta actually was in the first place. And that's basically there's two leading methods in statistics. There's the maximum likelihood estimation, and there's the method of moments. And, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the method of moments in a second. But before that, I wanted to actually mention the sigma to the three a little more. So it was a little shocking to me. And so I st you start digging a little bit. And there's this paper by Fred Sigworth, who's actually a specialist of cryoam since the early days. And he actually has this empirical observation. So here he is actually running maximum likelihood estimation on some simulated data, but for cryoEM. This is not the shift model, but he's looking at this. And he's actually trying to understand the reconstruction accuracy as a function of the signal to noise ratio. So essentially how, as a function of, uh, of one over sigma in our case. And what happens is he says, OK, if my SNR is large, then I have the usual you know, sigma over root n rate. So I have the usual scaling with sigma. But, it's, but if the SNR becomes small, like here, less than 5, then I start having a different slope. So this is a log log thing. And it says the slope is roughly as the third power. So this is the sigma to the 3 that Sigworth was actually observing. And it's because those signals that it was using were actually uh, uh, indistinguishable from their first two moments by the maximum likelihood. Right? You could modify, you could hope to try to use other features of those signals. But if you use vanilla maximum likelihood, it's not going to happen. All right, so let's just take a quick break and see what we've seen. So right now we've seen that the divergence between Gaussian mixtures is hard to compute, but right, so it's actually something that's notoriously hard to compute, but it reduces to moment matching using this very specific expansion, and that's a trick that was introduced by Lepsky, Nemirovsky, and Spokoini. And here the maximum likelihood estimator is actually optimal, and we've also derived what the rates of this maximum likelihood estimator were. And now the, what are the following questions? Well, you know, the following questions are how about algorithms? The maximum likelihood for a mixture of Gaussians is non-convex at all. And we use heuristics like expectation maximization. And that's how Sigworth built this, this thing. So it works well in practice. But you know, and there's some attempts at explaining why, certainly not in this model. And so the question is, can we use something? And usually the way you go from, uh, for a mixture of Gaussians, the way you go from uh, inefficient but optimal methods like maximum likelihood to efficient methods that are also optimal is by using the method of moments. So uh, by the way, EM is popular. This is the one that's introduced, that's uh, used in the most uh, popular uh, 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 algorithmic suite to, to study cryo-EM in practice. Uh, but there's no provable guarantees in this case. And so we're going to move on to the method of moments. So if the method of moments, can it be modified or include uh, orthogonalization of like semi-polynomials? Yeah, so, so I do not personally hear. Uh, it could be, and uh, that's the so-called generalized method of moments, when you actually use any expansion you want. It's always a mystery to me that actually the vanilla moments, like the vanilla polynomial expansion, is the one that works. And it's, it's, it's I mean, this is probably one of the biggest mystery of all this line of work. Why? And um, I mean, you know, Hermit, you can go because you have this, you know, Gaussian. I mean, it kind of makes sense sometimes, but it's still moments, right? It's still point. You know, I would want to see something that says, no, you need to use wavelets. <laughs> All right. And, th and they don't work any better either, or what? Oh, no, they work. In practice, method of moments is a disaster. So it's actually nice for, uh, I mean, we'll see, but we have to go to the constants are terrible. And more importantly, the method of moments rely very much on the, um, on the assumption that your model is well specified. So here I assume that everything was additive Gaussian noise that was isotropic. Method of moments is going to be extremely brittle to those assumptions, whereas the maximum likelihood is still going, since it's a variational formulation, it's still going to find a model that's the closest to reality within the class of models you're giving it. And it's actually doing a pretty good job. No, but did you say something about wavelets? Oh, yeah, wavelets don't show up at all here. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah, there's nothing multi scale going on here. So <clears throat> the question is now. Can I estimate those moments? Can I estimate those moments from my data? So remember, I mentioned what my moments were giving me in terms of Fourier. Now let's look at uh, how I could estimate those guys. So if I look at the expectation of my data, right? I just forget that there's an underlying shift going on. I just average everything. What I'm going to get is a vector in expectation, which is always the same coordinate, which is the average coordinate of my original theta, right? If I shift my theta, think about the original shift model. 
It's what, it's what I'm going to be getting. Very little information. I'm going to look at the second moment, which is the covariance matrix of, of, uh, of y. I remove some bias because I'm looking at the expectation of a square. There's going to be some reminder. And this is basically telling me the expectation of r times theta. So here again, theta, the expectation is with respect to a uniform r on the uh, har measure. So it's like r theta outer r theta. And I take the expectation, and this is this order covariance that I described. So just all the theta with inner product with shifts of itself. And then again, if I go to a higher order moments, I have this thing called triple covariance. It's hard to visualize what it is. And, uh, and uh, as I said, if you move to the Fourier domain, this is telling you the DC component, the zero Fourier coefficient. Auto covariance gives you the, the, phase, the moduli. And then in the triple covariance, you have some phase information. And the question is, why is this enough to recover some general, uh, some general um, uh, generic vector? Sorry. OK. So this is the technique we propose. It says, look at the third moment. This is going to consistently estimate at a rate sigma cubed over root n. And that's where you see the sigma cubed over root n to this expectation. And what I claim is that from this expectation, you can extract data. This, the Fourier version of this guy, so this, uh, the tensor that's filled with all this redundant information, right? You have a bunch of, uh, of, I'm sorry, partial information. You have a bunch of empty coordinates in this three-dimensional tensor. It's called the bispectrum, and it was actually a, a pretty popular uh, method in the early 90s. And uh, Janakis, for example, was someone that was pushing it a lot. Here they're looking at a very similar problem than the one I'm describing, except that they have this image of Calvin that's not uh, 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 shifted. It's actually shifted in two dimensions, so it's translated in two dimension. And they were using the bispectrum to reconstruct it. And they were working a lot on that in the early 90s, but then they said, oh, it must not be the right method because the number of observations we need to have is so big, right? I mean, estimating those three-dimensional thing requires uh, an accuracy of sigma cubed over root n, and it cannot be the right method to use. Turns out this is optimal, right? For many signals, what we show is that this was the right way to solve this problem. This bispectrum is the best thing. And so... What is, sorry, what does bispectrum mean? Oh, so the bispectrum is this... Uh, uh, three uh, order three tensor that has these entries. Uh, I don't know why it's called bispectrum. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, so what we propose, so there's actually, so this method of moments uh, coupled with machine learning has led to what's called tensor methods. So if you've heard about tensor methods, so I think they've benefited a lot from having tensor in the word TensorFlow uh, in the Google thing, but mostly they're, this tensor methods, it's just a, a method of moments where you need some algorithmic tricks to extract the information from this three-dimensional tensor. And, and since they're not matrices, for example, you want some low rank decomposition, you need some, some insight on how to decompose in uh, uh, those tensors. Usually it's like a rank one tensor plus some noise. And so, there's actually a very simple algorithm when you have a rank one tensor plus some noise, and that's the one we're going to be using. It's called generous algorithm. So this is how it goes. So what I claim is that uh, the tensor, this, is, this uh, expectation will give me, so this just means if I start from this expectation and I just take Fourier transforms, I'm going to be able to build a tensor that, which is this bispectrum tensor that's essentially giving me zero if there's nothing, if I, if, uh, sorry, if the sum of the entries of the indices is not zero, and just the product of those three Fourier coefficients if um, uh, the sum of the indices is zero. Okay, so that's a partially filled tensor. Okay, so from there I want to extract theta hat. Can I do that? And the answer is yes. And the, the, so I'm going to assume for simplicity that theta is symmetric. And so this is how you do it. All right, so I'm going to consider three entries that are actually present in this bispectrum, right? So theta i, a, b, so I need a plus b equals minus i, the sum is equal to zero, theta j, a, c, and theta k, b, c, okay? And I need all those three indices to sum to zero, so they're actually present. Now, there is a unique solution, let's say not dimension, for example, it's easy to check that there's a unique solution to uh, finding this A, B, and C that allow you to do this. So if I, was, if I had a candidate, a I, J, K, what I want to do is to reconstruct a given I, J, K whose sum of indices is not necessarily zero. So I pick my I, J, K, I solve this, it's gonna tell me which A, B, and C I need to pick, and then I have those three guys, and then I'm gonna multiply those three entries. And if theta is symmetric, then I'm gonna have theta c times theta c, which is going to come up as the modulus square of theta hat, of theta, and then b, b, and then a, a. Each of them shows twice, so that gives me exactly something that has only information about the modulus, and then I have something that multiplies my original uh, 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 triple that I was looking for in the first place. 
Now those guys I can estimate from my tensor of order two. So I let's assume I already know those guys up to an accuracy that I'm happy with, right? I can estimate them at sigma to the two over root n, which is much better than what I'm hoping to get here. So now I have a full tensor, which is full of those guys. I need to extract theta hat, but now that's very simple because if I have a tensor whose entries are theta, high, theta, theta hat i, theta hat j times theta hat k, then this is just theta hat to the three. And to uh, extract theta, so we don't, have some, we don't have spectral methods for this, and that's where the fact that it's generic is going to play a role. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just collapse this uh, tensor into a two-dimensional matrix. The way I do it is by just hitting it with a random vector v, right? So I'm just taking a random vector v, I'm hitting it. So I'm going to have one entry, which is theta hat u, uh, theta hat against v, and then I have theta hat, theta hat transpose, and now I can use the singular value decomposition to extract my theta hat. Now again, here you should be shocked because this is a, supposed to be a high dimensional problem. This inner product is not zero indeed for generic theta hat, but it's probably gonna be very small as a function of D, so it's not the optimum way to solve this, and there's other ways using power methods to do that a little better, but I'm not gonna go into that. But you have to do this for several, many, many vectors, or just one? Just one. Just one. Yeah, just one, because this will be non-zero, right? Yeah, I see. But, uh, but and if I try another one, I'll only get the same answer? Yeah, we, well, no, of course not, because there's noise. But if there was no noise, you would just have a different uh, eigenvalue. Okay, so that's basically it. So I have, I'm just collapsing. This is called Genrick's algorithm. It was developed maybe in the 50s. And, uh, and, uh, and um, it just allows you to extract theta hat when you are given this, uh, this tensor theta hat to the three. And you know this is actually working pretty well in simulations, right? So here, this is the relative error that I'm getting. So red is good, and uh, and basically what I want to see here is my sigma to the three over root n. So I want to see if this slope here corresponds to what I'm looking for, and uh, so this is a log log plot. So let's see what we're seeing, right? So we should have relative error, which is good when sigma cubed over root n is very small. If I take the log, this is telling me that I want sigma log sigma to be much smaller than one over six times log n. And here you see there's a weird thing, which is here I'm not plotting uh, log signal to noise ratio, I'm plotting minus log signal to noise ratio. So it's going the other way around. So if I look at this slope, I should see uh, uh, minus one sixth here. This is my, uh, sample, my log sample size. And so I, I, I recover precisely this, uh, this regime when I, when I look at this. Okay, this is more a sanity check. It's not real data or anything. Okay, so, um, uh, in the few minutes that I have left, I would like to just comment a little bit of where the group structure showed up, right? I sort of buried it very quickly, and, uh, and, or I used it uh, pretty in the, in the method of moments, I used it a lot. But if you look just at the statistical rates, I would like to be able to make some predictions. If you tell me, here's the group I'm using, not the cyclic shifts, I would like to make some predictions about what are the rates that I can have, which in turn means how many moments can you match because of, the, of this group action. So there's a bit of weird trade-off, meaning if my group is huge, then since I'm learning theta only up to group action, my, my, the, prob the problem that I have is actually much easier, right? If my group is everything, then there's nothing to learn. Anything is uh, anything up to group action. But if my group, so there's this weird trade-off which we don't really know how to quantify. But uh, so now we want to understand what, so this expectation is with respect to uniform group action on the Haar measure. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so now the, the question is how this will affect. And so, the way uh, invariant theory shows up is by noticing that if you look at the entries of this tensor, right? So sorry, there should be a, a tensor here. Uh, so the entries of this particular tensor are just degree m polynomials in the entries of theta, right? There's just summing this thing, and there's just the product of m of those entries. And so, you know, understanding those polynomials is part of invariant theory. And, uh, and uh, here's a classical question you may ask, all right? So there's uh, many uh, questions you may ask, but here's a classical question that, you know, is very similar to what we're interested in here. It says, describe a ring of polynomials in D variables which are invariant under the action of a group G on RD, okay? So invariant just means that the polynomial evaluated R theta is the same as the polynomial evaluated at theta for any R. So why do I care about this question? Well, because this actually gives me a recipe on how to predict uh, what those rates are going to be. And here's the informal theorem. It says, if I look at the ring of G, so here for a general group, invariant polynomials, and I assume that this ring is actually generated by low degree polynomials. And by low degree, I will quantify that by saying that I want those deg this degree to be at most delta. All right, so you give me the degree of those polynomials that I can use, and I will claim that I can generate all my invariant polynomials. Then I can actually solve that gives me immediately a rate 
uh, that says that uh, the orbit recovery can be solved at a rate sig uh, sigma to the delta, which is this degree, to over root n. And uh, uh, here's a proof. So basically it says, well, if I'm generated, if I have a polynomial that's generated by degree of uh, uh, at most uh, delta, so those are the only polynomials I care about, then the orbit will be determined only by this kind of polynomials where the degree is at most delta. Which mean, and what does it mean that the orbit of theta is determined by those polynomials? It means that if you give me something which is different evaluation of those polynomials, if those polynomials are actually different, it means that I started with a different theta. And so that is, that's what I mean by determined, which means, so therefore, if you actually, which means that you will not, if you give me theta and tau that are different, I will not be able to match moments of order uh, uh, delta, uh, the order delta, okay? Because this will generate everything. And so now that gives me this bound that I had for my uh, um, uh, relative entropy. And so that will immediately turn into this uh, rates of estimation. Okay, so now of course, uh, so this is absolutely not my specialty and uh, I know some people have much easier time, you know, guessing what the delta will be for a particular group, but let's look at some, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> representation theory 101 questions. So the first one, uh, the first uh, group we want is the group of rotation, say SOD. Now, again, this is really something that emphasizes the fact that recovering up to group, a group action can be completely silly. Because if I actually tell you, I give you a vector and I want you to recover this vector up to rotation, I'm really just asking you, what is the norm of this vector, all right? So this is a norm recovery question. And of course, it's gonna be easy, right? If I give you a bunch of vectors, theta, which are just rotation of this guy, you just estimate the norm per coordinate and it's going to be something that doesn't cost you much. You still have to go to degree two, it's not gonna be a basic average. And so what's gonna happen is that um, uh, uh, now here, of course, the ring of invariance is generated by the square two norm. And uh, that you know, tells you the rate that you would expect, which is sigma square over root n. Uh, now, if I look at the symmetric group, of course, this is the, probably the, ex this should be example one as usual. And now, what does it mean to recover theta up to group action? It means that I want to get theta up to permutation of its indices, right? So what I want is the bag of values of my vector theta. I don't care which one was first, which one was second. I want just a histogram of the values of theta, essentially. And now if I want to do this, well, it's not as obvious as you would want to do this, right? I mean, it's not a completely trivial question. Well, okay, one thing that I could do is to break all my vectors yi into a, a bunch of, you know, individual values and try to find a histogram of those guys. And, uh, and uh, it turns out that this, and, and this sounds like you would lose information, uh, but uh, uh, it turns out that the ring of invariance uh, uh, is the set of, of, of uh, is the space of symmetric polynomials, and here those are going to be generated by polynomials of degree d. So you cannot escape the worst case sigma to the d for this, which is the one you would get if you were to break this uh, y into into pieces and forget that they were coming from the same group action. Okay, so uh, just some recent results. Uh, so after we came up with this idea, uh, that with this result that was some actually quite pessimistic, similar to the cube is a pessimistic answer. Uh, Amit Singer's group, which has uh, a lot of people working on this cryo M question said, okay, we need to bypass this. So what can we, what more structure can we use? And they said, maybe the shifts are not uniform, right? Maybe when I, I could try to develop a method that says, maybe I want to force my molecules to freeze in the same direction or some subset of the directions possible. In which case, it turns out that, you know, under some conditions that there's no canceling patterns happening, then you can actually drop it down to sigma square over root n. And if you know signal processing, it turns out that sigma square over root n, what, it, what was I doing when I was doing this? I was trying to recover theta up to, from, its, uh, from the moduli of its Fourier coefficients and, and try to recover entirely the phase. And this is actually something where a lot of the compressed sensing expertise I've gone to, it's called phase retrieval. If I give you only the moduli of theta plus some structure, can you recover this signal? And so every time you see a rate which is sigma square over root n, it means that you were able to leverage some structure to solve phase retrieval. And this is what we're currently working on, which is to say, okay, if I have generically sparse signals, actually, and there's some maybe weaker conditions, you can actually recover those uh, uh, signals. So if theta itself has one zero even, or if it's say a Bernoulli or with probability one half, you kill some of those uh, thetas, then you can actually go back to the phase retrieval regime uh, down to sigma cubed over root n, which is a reasonable assumption, assuming that you have some zeros in there. It has, what I really like about this is that it has some ties with the so-called Beltway problem, uh, 
uh, anybody's familiar with the Beltway problem? It's a cute problem that's uh, sometimes referred to as the parkway problem or whatever highway you want, and also uh, as the partial digest problem. And the idea is if I give you a bunch of integers and I only give you the pairwise distances, the bag of pairwise distances between those integers, can you recover up to obvious, you know, shifts and, uh, and uh, mirror symmetry of what those integers were in the first place. It turns out there's some nice uh, algebraic geometry coming into play if you have, if you are in a collision freeness case when there's no uh, two, uh, two pairs of integers that have the same distance, then in this case you can show that um, uh, when, you, uh, when you have at least seven, there's a unique uh, way to recover from, uh, from those pairwise distances, when you have at least seven numbers. It's uh, Sophie Picard's problem, and, and then there were a bunch of counterexamples that came. Okay, so uh, just to uh, wrap it up, uh, so what we did here is to look at this simple problem called uh, uh, the sh phase shift problem, which is an example of multi-reference alignment problem. So it's called multi-reference alignment uh, historically, of course, we're not doing any alignment here. And uh, um, the optimal, we found the optimal rates of estimation. We showed that there is the possibility of having efficient algorithms. And I really view this as a path towards actually practically efficient algorithms. For example, the expectation maximization algorithm works well in practice. There should be something that we can exploit to show that this is actually provably uh, going to the uh, maximum likelihood estimator. And uh, we try to understand a little bit of what the impact of the group structure is. By the way, I actually skipped that. I should, I should mention this. Uh, there's this recent work by uh, Alex Wine and, and, and some of my co-authors that developed, that use uh, computational invariant theory to develop an algorithm that says, okay, give me a group and a dimension. So that's the limitation. You give me a group and a dimension. And what this uh, uh, software, this algorithm is supposed to give you is what is the number of moments you can match? What is basically the, this delta, the largest degree uh, uh, that you need to consider to generate your ring of invariant polynomials. And th what they fed to it, just for fun, they fed the cryo-EM example, right? Because the projection is just a linear operator. You can actually, everything I said, the projection is not going to affect uh, this technique. And so it turns out that if you actually, um, if you actually apply, uh, you feed in cryo-EM, you see sigma to the cube of a root n. So this three is actually coming up also for cryo-EM. Now, there's some limitations. For example, they can only prove that this will give you a finite number of answers. Uh, though, of course, it gives you only one answer in practice, things like this. All right, so uh, sorry, I gave you false hopes that this was over. Uh, all right, so, and, uh, so this is what we've done. And of course, the next questions are, what is the dependence in the dimension? So, so far, we have, um, so we don't have matching upper and lower bounds. We uh, suspect it to be linear. Every time you see sigma cube over root n, it should be d times sigma cube over root n, which is still not acceptable, all right? So, what was the statement again about the dimension dependence? Yeah, so, so right now our upper bound is d squared and our lower bound is d. And we think that the true answer is d. Okay. And, uh, and uh, so we don't have the statement. But I don't think there's, it's actually really something we should pursue to get the right dimension dependence because it's going to not represent what's actually happening in practice because the intrinsic dimension of the problem we're looking at is actually much smaller than D and that's, we need to find the right assumptions to actually get some D star, which is much smaller than D in there. Uh, we didn't deal at all with the projection step, uh, which, you know, the method of moment should be robust to this. And, uh, and of course, the, uh, the burning uh, um, uh, algorithmic question is what is the uh, performance of uh, expectation maximization on generic problems. And there's, a, there's a, a, a major thrust right now to try to understand this. So we know that in the worst case, this thing is going to go nowhere. But if you feed it some random problem or some you know, structured plus random problem, something that's smoothed out a little bit, then we hope that EM will work and we could actually prove that it works on, those, on such examples. Uh, so there's two things you can look at. One, not yet, but soon, uh, that we worked on. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.